Last week, uh, I was at a church event at the church that my family and, and I attend, and, and I bumped into a friend of mine who, who told me a story that, that honestly I, I didn't really even remember. Um, we, were, we were in a small group together. My wife and I, we, we led a small group two, maybe even three years ago, and, and this friend was, was in our small group, and he, and he, he reminded me of something that happened um, I had asked a question uh, in the, our small group discussions, and we sort of went around the circle, and everybody answered the question, um, but nobody knew an answer. It, it was, you know, I don't know, I'm not sure, I don't really know, and, and it kind of got around the circle, and nobody had answered the question, and it got to me, you know, the last person to speak in, in the small group, and, uh, and I think everybody sort of expected that I, I was going to, you know, provide some answer to whatever question I, I had asked, and I just said, you know, I don't know either. And uh, we, we all sort of chuckled and went on with the group discussion. But this friend said last week how much it impacted him for me just to say, I, I don't know, and not have an answer. And he said that he, he even went on to lead another small group later. And part of what gave him the confidence to go and to lead a small group himself was the fact that it was okay to not have an answer. And then he said that he's even encouraged several other couples to lead a small group in our church telling that story, that it's okay to simply say, I don't know, I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer. I've thought a lot about that the past week since he shared that with me. And I, I've thought a lot about it as we've started reading in the Daily Walk reading schedule through the book of Job. Um, Job is... Um, it's, it's, a, it's a weighty, heavy book to read. And this week and next week, if you're following along with us in the Daily Walk Bible reading schedule, we're, we're reading Job this week, Job chapters 1 through 19. And, and this story, it's, it's just gut-wrenching to read. It opens in chapter 1. Job, we, we find out he's a, <clears throat> he's a righteous man. He, he loves God, he fears God, he hates evil, and he's serving God with his, with his whole life and his whole heart. And, and then there's this conversation that happens in, in the heavens between God and the accuser or, or Satan. And, 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 and Satan is, is allowed to, to challenge Job's faithfulness and love of God. Satan believes that Job just serves God because God's blessed him. And God gives Satan permission to create some pain in Job's life to see if he'll stay faithful. And so Job experiences just tremendous loss. His kids, his health, he just is experiencing pain upon pain upon pain. E even at the end of chapter 2, his wife really begins to question almost Job's sanity for staying faithful to God amidst all of this pain and suffering. And, and Job says at verse 10, you, you are talking like a foolish woman. <laughs> Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And in all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. And then in chapter 2, verse 11, the very next verse, the story takes a bit of a turn. And Job has three friends who, who hear about Job's suffering, who hear about Job's pain, and they, they come to him. Job chapter 2, verse 11. Then Job's three friends, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him. And they set out from their homes and they met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud. They tore their robes and they sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great was his suffering. What a powerful picture that is. These friends who hear about Job's suffering and come to him, and all of these are signs of just uh, of their hurt and anguish for seeing their friends suffer. And they sit on the ground for seven days and seven nights in silence, just with him. 
And then chapter 3, the story begins to change. Job, after seven days and seven nights of, of silence, finally speaks. His his, his words are, are words of lament. His, his tone begins to change a little bit and, and then begins what you'll read most of this week from chapter 3 through chapter 19, this dialogue that happens between Job and these three friends. And the, the friends, though after they sat with him in silence for seven days, but begin to to accuse Job, begin to condemn Job, begin to question Job. And their argument is something like this. And you'll notice this as you read through these chapters. Their argument is something like this. Number one, God is is completely in control. He is entirely in control of all things. Number two, God is entirely just and God is entirely fair. Number three, so, so... If that's true, then he must always punish wickedness and he must always bless righteousness. And so his friends conclude that if Job is suffering, it must be because he has sinned and he is being punished for his unrighteousness. And so you read through these chapters, you see that argument sort of played out in the speeches that Job gives or Job hears from his friends, and this accusation and this condemnation from these friends begin to pile on, and, and you can just sense the, the building frustration and pain in the heart and life of Job. And as you read, though, you, you have to remember that, that we, as the, the reader of the story, we, we know something that Job doesn't know, and, and we know something that his friends don't know that Job's suffering it's not because of his wickedness but rather it's ultimately because of his righteousness and that got me thinking back to the power of a simple I don't know but back to the impact of not having an answer not having an explanation What Job's friends, what they got right before they began to speak, before they began to argue and pile upon Job their condemnation, what they got right was their silence and their presence. And I wonder as we read Job together this week, if if maybe God wants to remind us that as we care for those who are suffering, as we minister to those who are experiencing injustice and pain and loss, that silence and presence may be much more needed than our explanations and our words. Let's be people who sit on the floor in suffering and silence long before we are the people who think we can explain the ways of God that are often far beyond our understanding.